Hello, and welcome to Faith Bible Church. Today's service is being held online due to external circumstances affecting us all. Nevertheless, thanks to technology, we can still sing and hear God's word. For announcements, as you know, the, uh, all public gatherings are closed. So until the viral threat has subsided, we will continue to meet together online. This does not mean that the church is closed, for the church office is still ready to serve you and receive your calls. On the screen uh, below me, you will see that contact information should you wish to contact the church office. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the ability to gather together, even if it be over the airwaves and online. Thank you so much for your son that you've given to us and the hope that we have in you. Lord, may, uh, may we all be encouraged as we lift our voices together to sing your praises and as we hear the truth of God's word being spoken. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our call to worship today will come from Psalm 135, verses 1 to 4. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord's, in the courts of the house of God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. Would you please join us in singing of the hymn, Blessed Assurance. Our first scripture reading for today will come from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. 
I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps his faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, and who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens up the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over those sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to generations. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please join us in singing the hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. I will now be reading our second scripture reading for today, coming from Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 to 25. 
Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us not to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is exceedingly good. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregations said to stone them with stones, But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make them or I will make you a nation greater and mightier than they. But Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it, for you brought them up in your might from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land. They have heard you, or that they have heard you, O Lord, are in the midst of the people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard your fame will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give them that he has killed them in the wilderness. And now please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But as truly as I live, as all the earth shall be filled up with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give their fathers. And none of those who despised me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Now, since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. This is the reading of God's word. Would you please join with us in the singing of the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul.
Thank you for joining together with us on those beautiful hymns. Indeed, we can sing with confidence, It is well with my soul. We are going to go to prayer now for the pastoral prayer at this customary time of our service. And as we pray for our Jerusalem, we will be praying for Downing Street. For our mission partner, we are going to be praying for Thor and Linda and the Tambov Church in Russia, that God's blessing would be upon them and their leadership, Pastor Ruben Nazarchuk. Also from our church congregation, we are going to be praying for a family of three who come to Faith Bible Church regularly, and they have a teenage son, and they also are involved very much, the mother and the father, in health care, and so it is very fitting that we be upholding them, even as we are upholding all who are serving on the front lines, both locally and all around the world. Please join with me in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege and the opportunity that is ours to come before you. And we give you thanks for all of your blessings. How blessed indeed we are. And we give thanks where it ought to be given to you. So Lord, hear us in this expression that we bring. We would bring all of our needs before you. Hear us and help us and work deep within each of our hearts, we pray. Do your mighty work and receive praise, honor, and glory. We pray out of our own Jerusalem for Downing Street, praying that there your word would be sent forth and that your light would shine so brightly. We think of each of our mission partners. Bless them, we ask, particularly through the challenges of these days. Bless abundantly, we ask. Particularly, right now, we would pray for Thor and Linda and the connection and the partnership that we have with the Tambov Church. Bless Reuben and his wife, Luba, and may you continue to send forth your word from them and through all who serve along with them. We pray for this family from our own congregation who we have come to today. Bless them. We pray that you would uphold them, give them much wisdom in the responsibilities which they bear, and may your word continue to abound in their hearts and through them into the lives of so many others. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for workers for the gospel harvest. We pray for those in authority, particularly during these days, as well as those because of gospel witness are now in chains. We pray for your word to be sent forth with a power as it ought to be sent forth. We pray for our own hearts to be tender before you. We pray that your coming would not be long. May this be a day of your salvation. May this be a day of your word proclaimed and received and gladly believed. Hear us, O God, and for every need, whatever the nature of it might be, whether it be for home or work or school, O God, hear us in the petitions that we bring and receive the praise, honor, and glory. And now as we open your word, may it indeed be open before us we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles, and I'm turning to Hebrews chapter 3 and reading from verses 14 to 19. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned? whose bodies fell in the wilderness, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see 
that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. As I record this message, it is Saturday, April the 18th, 2020. Six days after our very unusual celebration of Easter. And we continue to make our way through the COVID pandemic, which has not only claimed so many lives, but changed all of our lives so radically. Even if we do not know a single person who has contracted the sickness. At the end of 2019, I was considering what should be the focus of my preaching for this year, not having any inkling of what would lay ahead of us. I had just preached for 12 weeks through Peter's first letter, five meaty chapters of Christ-centered, Christ-exalting, Christ-honoring, Christ-glorifying material from the old Galilean fisherman's pen. I sensed it would be good and right that we continue for 2020 in another study and set of sermons which also magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I chose an old favorite of mine, the book of Hebrews. So we started along and then our lives were so surprisingly disrupted and I sought to preach from various Old Testament and New Testament texts messages of God's encouragement. I make no apology for breaking into this set of sermons from Hebrews, but now what to do? I again sense a strong pull back to the book of Hebrews that we all be fed from its riches through these turbulent times. I am constantly amazed, though I must be embarrassed to make such an admission, at how God's word speaks so perfectly to our day. The book of Hebrews has been customarily called the book of better things. But I am not at all sure anyone is impressed by the claim. We are bombarded constantly by the advertisers who fervently claim their detergent, their bank, their car, their clothing label or coffee is better than the other guy's sludge. The end result is that the word better, along with so many other good words, are robbed of their punch. Perhaps we should take our stand beside the strong angel who, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 2, proclaimed with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? But let us change the question slightly while still moving in the same direction. Let us ask, even as Hebrews itself asks, who is worthy of my confidence and trust? Where can I go to find a rock which will not give way in the storms of life? Where is there a sure foundation which will give assurance and hold me to the very end. Those who were the first to receive this letter and read it had come to know Christ and rejoice in him. They had been gladly willing to forfeit career advancement and worldly goods because they saw in Christ something of such surpassing greater value. Like the earliest believers who rejoiced in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Think of that. These Hebrews had also suffered both tangibly and in the intangible realm of things. But the passing of months and years had a wearing effect on their faith. Being Jews, they had come out of Judaism, but now they were thinking they should beat a retreat. Perhaps they had been all wrong about this Jesus fellow. The book of Hebrews was written to boldly declare, you were not in any way mistaken or foolish. Jesus Christ is fully worthy of your confidence and trust. 
He is the rock upon which you may stand, even in the storms which might so easily knock you down. The sure foundation is Jesus Christ, and there is no assurance policy to compare to him. He is the beginning and the ending, and is more than able to hold you to the end. You don't need any lengthy discourse from me that the whole world has been completely rattled in a very short space of weeks due to rapidly changing and frequently conflicting news reports. Confidence is as scarce as toilet paper and hand sanitizer has been. Personally, the month of March was a, a vivid picture for me of the transformation of 31 days. On March 1st, I woke up in a motel room in the far south of New Mexico. I had just driven across Texas from a convention in Nashville the previous week, and the following week I was to enjoy a bit of rest and relaxation with Charlene and others in Phoenix. Fast forward from the beginning of March to the end of March, and by March 31st, we had already seen two Sundays with no church services, and the church office was to be vacant for the next number of days as workers who were deemed non-essential for profit and non-profit offices they were to be closed. May I digress for a moment? It has been most revealing to look into the hearts and minds of those who have composed the lists of what is deemed essential during these days. While the work of pastors and clergy is classified as non-essential, along with the beer and liquor outlets, the cannabis stores are open. What was illegal up until such recent times is suddenly essential to the well-being of Manitobans, apparently. It is hard not to speak up when authorities are so desperately foolish in their choices. We are talking about confidence. Are the news reports accurate? Are the politicians manipulating events to their own advantage? Are the medical protections and services what they ought to be? Are there darker forces at work behind what is plainly visible? What will our world look like six months, 12 months, 24 and 36 months from now? The book of Hebrews holds out Jesus Christ as the one in whom our confidence is rightly placed, especially in times of uncertainty. In the mid-1980s, when Charlene and I had been married for about two years, we purchased an almost new Hyundai Stellar. At the time, it was the largest car that the recently new to Canada Hyundai car company was selling, but compared to some of the good old big V8 boats I had previously driven, it seemed on the smaller side and a bit underpowered. Let me point out it was a five-seater car. We enjoyed and drove that thing all over Canada, and it was the car to bring home our baby number one from the hospital. But luggage was a bit of an issue. So after a few years, we bought a station wagon in time to welcome baby number two. A few more years and baby number three came along and we bought a minivan to cart, not just the five who could have fit into the good old Hyundai, but to transport all of that luggage. A lot of miles went on that first minivan, but then we bought a bigger minivan. Then a suitcase was strapped to the roof, and that was followed by a rooftop carrier and devices hanging off the back of the van. I could hardly believe the amount of baggage. It subtly accumulates, and if we, if we are not alert to its presence, 
Certainly I would be less than truthful if I didn't say I was glad to be well supplied personally by all of that baggage and that no female on any family trip was compelled to say, I must go shopping for I have nothing to wear. But from the six verses at the end of chapter 3 here in Hebrews, I want to talk to you about the baggage of unbelief. Has it occurred to you that baggage can be both that which is seen and that which is unseen? And I hold out to you the baggage which is unseen can be more limiting and restraining to movement than that which is seen. Hebrews chapter 3 reminds us of the Israelites who Moses led out of slavery in Egypt. They were led right up to the border of the promised land with all of their goods and stuff. But there was some baggage they had which restrained them and did not allow them to enter into the promised land which God had reserved for them. What was that baggage? That baggage was unbelief. Now that may sound quite odd. We think of unbelief as the absence of something which ought to be there. But the heart of the problem was not that they were a people who lacked conviction. They believed very strongly indeed. They believed that the God who had rescued them from one nation was spent and didn't have the strength to give them victory over another nation. They believed that they were ever friendless, constantly vulnerable, and in danger of being left hungry and thirsty. They believed in the lifeless image of the golden calf, which they had made rather than in the God who they could see. Even though they fled in terror when God came down on Mount Sinai amid thunderings and lightnings and the sound of a trumpet blast like they had never heard before. They believed if you are going to get ahead in this world, you need to look out for yourself and be sure to think for yourself and never be afraid to grumble and complain as much as you jolly well like. They had sort of a holy book of their own making and they were a people of resolute belief. But in the face of politically correct nonsense, which says all holy books and beliefs are equally true, good, and valid, I tell you that these people had beggared and impoverished themselves by their beliefs. They had left out the God of glory and thereby missed the glory of God. They had left out the God who is true and thereby missed the truth of God. They had left out the God who is utterly faithful and thereby had robbed themselves of peace and confident assurance. In verse 14, the first readers are described as those who, along with the writer, have become something that they had not always been. In a similar way, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, Peter wrote, You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had, past tense, you had not received mercy. But now you have received mercy. And Paul had written to the Ephesians in chapter 2 that they had been dead in trespasses and sins, but God had raised them up with Christ. This is a description of what God has done indeed for every believer. Hebrews chapter 3 says, we have become partakers of Christ. This is like the grafting imagery which Paul uses in Romans chapter 11, verses 
17 down to 24. The wild olive branch is grafted into the root of a healthy and rich olive tree, and it partakes of what it never knew before. It speaks of fabulous privilege. But there is also the urgency of continuance, the urgency of continuing, pressing on, the privilege of partaking, the privilege of enjoying what had not been previously known may so easily be frittered away and forfeited. Foolish assumptions may accumulate and a new foreign and fictitious belief system may be founded which has no even, which has no even remote tie with the God of the Bible. It was for this reason back in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 3, we hear, take care. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Even the one is important. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Note that an unbelieving heart is not a neutral heart. It is an evil heart. Not all belief systems are equal in God's sight, though this world has wildly different thoughts on the matter. And secondly, see that God is described as the living God. The choice is you can have the living God or you can have dead ritual. You can submit to the living God or you can have the lifeless, albeit golden, calf. You can have the living God who, because he is alive, is able to see and hear and act on your behalf, or you can have the strain and struggle of all your own efforts in the vain hope that something will come of it all. The glad, joyful assurance you had when you came to trust in Christ hold that in the very same way each and every day. See Jesus Christ who has died on Calvary for your sins and mine. See him laid in the tomb and yet now that tomb is vacant. He is alive. Toss any baggage of unbelief, any belief in anyone or anything other than in the living God and enter into all the spiritual blessing. He has prepared for you today. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. So easily it trips us up and it must be set aside. Anything that holds us back from growing in Christ and from a mature, steady faith in Christ, is baggage we can happily and most certainly do without. Anything you need to ditch? Let fly. Let her go and run with all your might to the finish where Jesus beckons you on. In chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews, the writer of this book repeatedly speaks of today, today, and quotes three times out of Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As the Holy Spirit of God takes his word and speaks to each one of us, this is the day to come before him, and confess that unbelief, that trust you have foolishly and sinfully placed where it ought not to be and put it instead in the Lamb of God who is our sure foundation. Yesterday is gone and will never be seen again. 
None of us has the promise of tomorrow. Today is the day of God's pleading with you that you might be in right and holy fellowship with him, all on the basis of Calvary. Come before him, and I plead with you, even as scripture does, come now. Would you bow with me in prayer? Loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the word of warning, the word of danger that is sounded out. We thank you that you have reminded us of the examples of those who have gone before us that we might take warning and that we might be taking care. I pray for every man and every woman who hears this that we would see the baggage that can hold us back, the baggage that can weigh us down, the baggage that is called unbelief, and that it might be thrown aside and that we might throw ourselves completely upon you, that our confidence might be in you and in you alone. So work in hearts and lives, receiving praise, honor, and glory. Those who have previously walked with you and they've walked away, may they come back and rejoice again for those who have never come to know you and have now heard of this great God, this living God. May they come and find in you life abundant and everlasting. So hear us, Lord, and work your will, receiving the glory that is so due. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I would encourage you to join together as we conclude by singing, I know whom I have believed.
Thank you for joining together with us again today. May this service be a blessing to very many. And please share with others the availability of these videos that others might be blessed and strengthened. The benediction today comes again from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.